الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد أهلا وسهلا ومرحبا بكم uh, Welcome all to this inshallah ta'ala beneficial podcast on a topic that many uh, brothers and sisters um, you know have highly requested and it is the topic of marriage so as we know there are many aspects to the topic of marriage um, and previously I've actually done a course uh, for brothers on the topic of marriage and how to prepare for marriage and and other aspects um, pertaining to that and so um, I thought instead of doing it as a you know a formal course um, that it may be better to break down the different uh, categories of this uh, very vast and, and general topic <coughs> and break them down into five uh, major categories that inshallah ta'ala will be breaking down into um, you know five different episodes if you will five different episodes and so there's a main theme which is going to be uh, marriage 101 uh, guidelines for finding a suitable spouse and so that is very general as we know um, and this will not simply just be um, you know how do you find a, a, a you know a good spouse or a, a suitable spouse it is actually going to be talking about marriage from many different aspects and enlightening brothers and sisters on a lot of things that we don't normally hear uh, when we for example study kitab nikah you know the chapter of nikah in any book for example any fiqh book that is taught at the masjid maybe our local masjid um, a lot of things are not dealt with and are not handled um, or are not dealt with and uh, are not discussed when teaching these um, sorts of classes to the communities and so inshallah ta'ala um, I will be mentioning things that you know some of us or maybe a lot of us may already know as it pertains to marriage and the different aspects of marriage however the intent and the goal of this podcast uh, with its uh, different parts and different episodes will be to hopefully assist brothers and sisters on things to um, and for example uh, first of all have knowledge of before embarking on the journey of seeking a uh, a spouse and likewise things to do during that process um, things to watch out for, things to pay attention to, uh, guidelines to follow. And so there will be, you know, very practical things, uh, as you'll see. And there will also be um, general advices and general guidelines um, pertaining to marriage and, and how to seek a potential spouse. And because we all hear it nowadays, brothers saying that, you know, there's no more there are no good sisters anymore and we also hear sisters saying there are no good brothers anymore and that it is hard to get married in this time etc etc and so inshallah what I hope to come out of this uh, podcast or these these series or this series uh, this uh, this series is uh, hopefully brothers and sisters will learn a thing or two that they previously did not know uh, when it came to seeking a potential spouse and so especially the one of the episodes which will be about the questions to ask a potential spouse um, and I'll talk about that inshallah ta'ala uh, that will come in the fourth episode <coughs> and so without further ado um, I'll mention the different topics that will be covered in this series which will be the titles for each episode inshallah ta'ala and the first one being the purpose and importance of marriage the purpose and importance 
of marriage and why that is going to be discussed and why that is even something that needs to be discussed will also be mentioned uh, in today's episode, inshallah ta'ala. The second episode will be roles and responsibilities in marriage. Where do we, re- where do we derive them from? Roles and responsibilities in marriage. And where do we derive them from as Muslims? The third episode, how to prepare for marriage. And so I will be giving step-by-step uh, guidelines and advices on how one would prepare for marriage. Number four, questions to ask a potential spouse. And I'm going to break down those questions into different categories. Inshallah ta'ala. And the fifth and final episode, bi'idhnillah, will be advice to the parents regarding their children as it pertains to marriage. And it is possible that we may add that um, we may add that fifth episode to the fourth and just make it four episodes, inshallah ta'ala. And so we'll see. Um, it'll all depend on uh, the time, inshallah ta'ala. So without further ado, we'll get started with the with today's episode, inshallah ta'ala, which is the purpose of marriage in Islam. And also before I continue, uh, I'd like to note also that every episode or every episode that I've mentioned, all these titles, the five titles that I previously mentioned, all have subcategories, meaning um, that title is not the only thing that is going to be discussed. That is just the general theme of the episode, but I will be speaking about several different topics um, on that episode, inshallah ta'ala. So the first topic, uh, today's topic, inshallah ta'ala, is the purpose of marriage in Islam. And so what do we mean by that? And what, why, what is the reason behind having to discuss and teach Muslims the purpose of marriage in Islam? Uh, and in order to better understand the reason behind that, uh, there will be two general you know, ideas that will be discussed in this uh, podcast and the first one will be how do we view marriage today as Muslims especially young Muslims and what are the things that influence us in how we see and what our view is and what our outlook is on marriage and then comparing that to what marriage is supposed to be and what the actual goal of marriage is within Islam. So the first topic I'd like to talk about is misconceived concepts, notions, and outlook of marriage influenced by the entertainment world. And so what do I mean by that? Uh, Muslims nowadays have many different things that are influencing them. And the biggest thing, especially for those who aren't really practicing, is the entertainment world music, movies, uh, what we see on social media, uh, TV shows and sitcoms, um, influencers, uh, you know, social media influencers and the like. Uh, This is, even though we are Muslims, these things play a huge role in how we see life in general, uh, what we normalize in our lives, what we follow and what we believe. And so it is not then surprising that something as big as marriage is also influenced by these things. It just makes sense. If other things in our life, you know, in our lives are influenced by these things, then likewise, something such as marriage will likewise, or our view of marriage and what we think of it and how we think it should be, will also be influenced by these things. And so the first point is the normalization of the standard relationship being boyfriend and girlfriend and not husband and wife. And so why is that a problem? In the Western society and what they depict in these movies and in these shows, usually you will find the glorification of you know, the relationship being or the standard relationship being 
boyfriend and girlfriend. Meaning, marriage is a thing of the past. Marriage is a thing of the past. And the actual standard is simply relationships. What this does to us, even though we are Muslims, and we know in general that our religion encourages marriage and, and, and does not encourage you know, illicit relationships and impermissible relationships outside you know, the realm of marriage, although we know that in the back of our minds, we still date, we still find Muslims dating one another, we still find Muslims who have boyfriend and girlfriends. We still find Muslims who are indulging in, um, you know, illegal sexual intercourse. And so, why is that the case? That is because in the societies that we live in, the norm and the standard, and we're actually kind of desensitized to it, even though some of us may be practicing, we practice our religion and we know these things and we know what is permissible and impermissible in our religion. However, the standard relationship is, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend. And that is what we find in movies. That is what we find in TV shows. That is what we find entertainers, athletes doing every other month, dating someone different. You know, the biggest news or even sometimes breaking news more than, uh, you know, important matters around the world that are happening around the world. Breaking news you know, news that will be just as important as, for example, um, a genocide happening in, in a part of the world, you'll find so-and-so broke up with so-and-so, and so-and-so is now dating so-and-so in the entertainment world, and they busy the people with that, and it's all over social media, and there's comments under, under those posts and all of that, and the Muslims are indulging in these things. So after a while, that becomes the norm for you. That becomes the norm for you. So marriage is something then looked down upon or not sought after or the, the importance of it kind of dies down. And that is what happens, especially when you live amongst, you know, uh, the, the disbelievers in their lands. This is what is normalized and then becomes normal for us as well. Number two is the, the dating scene as a culture and a standard for relationships. So you will no longer find, for example, you just think about it. So when, especially in America, in Canada, you know, in Europe, when someone moves to a particular city, one of the questions they ask the people that they meet there is, what is the dating scene like here? What is the dating scene? There's even a term for it, the dating scene. There's no term for a marriage scene because that is not what is sought after rather than what is normalized is sleeping with a bunch of different people dating people and trying things out trial and error relationships right and this is a culture there is an actual culture and obviously in the west because they don't follow any any type of um, you know religion when it comes to these affairs um, having intercourse and fornicating and these things are not things that are looked down upon in these societies and so because that is the norm in these societies and that is the standard you know to date people until you find the one right until you find your your knight in shining armor or until you find your uh your queen or whatever they they, they say this is the actual culture there and that is an evil culture because it, it leads to the diminishing of the, you know, for the, the desire for marriage diminishes. And likewise, uh, realizing its importance and its benefit, that diminishes when this becomes culture and this becomes part of society and this is what's normalized in society. And this also, um, you know, plays a big role or what also plays a big role in this is blind following these type of people. And when these people are your role models and you take these people as the people you follow in how you behave, in how you speak, in how you dress, in how you think, in what you believe, right? You follow them in all of these things. That is then how these types of things are normalized for you. And it would I don't believe it would be far-fetched to say that younger Muslims today date more than they marry 
especially in the West. Um, you know, those who are older in age, like our parents' generation, grandparents' generation, of course not. The standard and the norm would be uh, marriage. However, those who are today in their 30s, 20s, right, the norm is dating. Getting married is, get, getting married is something foreign. It's a foreign concept. Getting married at the age of 20 today is a foreign concept, whether it's a, a man or a woman. It is a foreign concept. It is something strange to hear that someone married at 20 years old, whereas 10, 15 years ago, it was pretty standard. And it wasn't a shock or a surprise to see that someone would marry at the age of 18 or at the age of ten, uh, 20. But today, the 20-year-old is, look, is looked at as a 10-year-old. And the 25-year-old is looked at as a 15-year-old. And the 30-year-old is looked at as a 20-year-old. Right? Everyone is still a baby. Uh, no one is mature enough. No one is ready. My son is not ready and my daughter isn't ready, right? But they're ready to have, you know, illegal intercourse. And they're ready to have children out of wedlock. And they're ready to, um, ha you know, date 15 to 20 people before they ever, you know, decide that, okay, now it's time for marriage. So they're ready for all of that. But for some reason, they're not ready for marriage. For some reason, they're not ready for marriage. This dating culture also plays a huge role in the increase in the divorce rate. And why is that? When the standard becomes dating and that is the norm and all you do is date people and you try them out see how they're like sleep with them for a few months or see if it's going to work out and then after that you break up and then you go on to the next guy or the next girl and you continue doing that same thing five years ten years has passed and now you've dated all these individuals and you, all, all of these people does your outlook and your hope for marriage increase with that type of uh with the, you know in that type that type of process that you've t chosen that process to find the one does your hope and what you think of marriage and and your hopes of marriage does that increase no what 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 happens to women usually who do that who date uh, and, and get cheated on or date and then this happens and that happens and they break up and then heartbreak and then try another one and over and over again 5 years 10 years down the line all she says is or all you'll hear is all men are the same. I can't trust a man. Men are this and men are that. That is what happens to her. Because she chose this path. She chose this path to find a man. And so the type of men that she was, you know, uh, seeking were the ones who only wanted one thing from her. And so obviously then, your, your outlook and your view of marriage and your hope for marriage and finding a good man who will treat you properly, etc., is going to uh, decrease. Likewise, what happens is this culture of dating and breaking up and getting with someone and breaking up and then even going into a relationship saying things like, I'm just going to see how it is. If it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, oh, you know, um, on to the next one. What does that uh, create? What does that create? That type of culture, what does that create? What it creates is a, a culture of people who do not know what commitment means. Meaning when your brain functions that way, where the relationship that you're in with another, in, with, with another person, uh, it, does, it doesn't require that level of commitment. Meaning if, if you break up, it's fine. You know, we broke up, whatever. That was, you know, it, the sanctity of marriage and the importance of marriage dies down. And so what happens is people who date 15, 20, 25 people before they marry, right? Once they marry, they're so used to not being committed to an individual, every little thing will be a breakup. And so divorce is actually just seen as a breakup nowadays. And this is also amongst the Muslims. They are also desensitized to this. You know, 
marriage, the bond of marriage is supposed to be something strong. It's supposed to be two individuals that are committed to one another, working to achieve, you know, something in our religion, something that inshallah ta'ala will lead those two individuals and their children to paradise. It's an act of worship in Islam, right? It, it's not just merely the relationship, but in our religion, we're rewarded for marriage and having children and all of these things. So that is not looked at. Rather, the culture of dating and dating and breaking up and dating and breaking up, breaking up that plays a role in, your, in the mentality that you now have even as a married individual. Where if men are used to dating a bunch of women or sleeping around with a bunch of women, it's easy for him then to marry, sleep with a woman for a few days, and divorce her a week later. That's perfectly normal because their brain is wired that way now. And that is the harm of this dating culture. It, it, it removes the sanctity and the importance of marriage from the mind and from the heart. And that is why we're seeing people married for a week and divorcing, a few months and divorcing, a year and divorcing, one child after one child divorcing. And, and this is all from any one of the main reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons is this dating, this concept of dating until you find the one. And, and obviously for a woman also, it's, it's even worse because she's given herself up to men. And then what that does for her also in terms of her value as a woman and, and, and being sought after, etc., that also diminishes. So there's, there's great harm in this culture. And there's great harm in what it does psychologically, what it does physically, and what it does also spiritually. Another harm is the, the idea of marriage or the, and the, um, yeah, the, I'll say the idea, the idea of marriage being reduced to what we see in movies, in TV shows, Reality TV, right? Romantic dinners, honeymoons, materialism, you know, buying me this and buying me this purse and buying me that and buying me this. And if the marriage does not have these things in it, then the individual is unhappy. And so, likewise for the man, if a woman isn't like this and is not like that and he's getting these ideas of how a woman should be from social media, from television, from the entertainment world in general, what, what that does is it makes you seek an unrealistic uh, relationship. You start making your standards things that are not actually uh, reality. So you're looking at lives of celebrities. You're looking at lives of people in the entertainment world millionaires who glorify this type of lifestyle for you and so what happens is even when you are not in that reality you're not living in that reality right you expect that from the man who, who's supposed to marry you and and likewise the man expects certain things from a woman that is not realistic and so Meaning, for example, if men are nowadays looking on social media and seeing all these women with plastic surgery and all of these things that look like Barbie dolls, and then that is what they expect their wife to look at, uh, look like. Yes, obviously you want your wife to be healthy looking and all of that. And however, the unrealistic, you know, pictures and things like that that you see all over social media now, right? That that also plays uh you know plays a part in how you view beauty now and it affects you psychologically and then what happens is because that is what you're looking at all day now when your wife doesn't any yeah, meet those uh, or that criteria that criteria of beauty you no longer are attracted to her and that now harms your marriage that now harms your marriage and so there's bo on both sides that what is happening now is marriage which is a lot more, and we'll learn, inshallah ta'ala, what Islam says about marriage and what the purpose of marriage is. But when we're ignorant of that, or we ignore that, right, and that our outlook and our expectation of what marriage should be 
is reduced to only those things. Not saying that uh, a husband being romantic with his wife is not something praiseworthy. Rather, it is. Or that he doesn't buy his wife gifts at, uh, at, at times. Or that if he's, if he's capable, that he does not take his wife on a trip. No, all of these things are permissible. All, all of these things are encouraged to, to uh, cause any love, their love and harmony uh, to grow uh, between a, a couple. However, the point here that is being mentioned is that all of marriage is reduced to these things. And that is why we see nowadays a lot of sisters saying, if he's not doing this or that, then I don't want him. If he's not buying me this, then I, you know, then I don't want him. Then he's not worthy. If he's not giving me 50K mahar, then he's not worthy. So what is marriage to you? What is marriage to you with that mentality? What is marriage? And what do you know about marriage and the purpose of marriage in Islam? Because you are a Muslim. You are a Muslim at the end of the day. If that is what marriage has been reduced to for you, then the type of marriage that you will get should not shock you. Usually those marriages do not last because people are going into them with unrealistic expectations, with things that they're uh, you know, getting from social media and the entertainment world and all of these things, and blindly following these individuals. Those same people who have these things and have as a either a, not, not a spouse, but a boyfriend or whatever the case is, someone they're seeing being a millionaire and giving them all of these things are still getting cheated on. You still find them crying all over social media because this happened to them and that happens to them. They can't keep a man. They can't stay married. And why is that? If that was the purpose of marriage, that is the point. If these are the things that bring happiness in a marriage, a 50K maha, this, this bag and this bag, and, and trips to this place and that place, and eating at this place so I can post it on social media, that is what a relationship is reduced to, a marriage, in an Islamic marriage. And if those things are not present, then I'm miserable and I want a divorce, right? If that is all marriage is, then that is what, that is what happens in the end. People are unhappy in their marriages because of unrealistic things. And this is the problem with social media. And one of the greatest, greater harms of social media is when you, when you keep seeing these things on social media and this is, these are the things that are influencing you, it affects your reality. You're looking at a world that is unrealistic, a fake world, and applying it to your real world. That is the problem with social media and those who in reality live in that world more than they even do in the real world. <clears throat> also another harm of um, you know deriving our outlook on marriage on what we see in the entertainment world and, and all of that is that this causes a lot of brothers and a lot of sisters to become averse to marriage to not want to marry anymore to not want to do with anything that you know is connected to marriage and that is one of the greater harms and the harms of that uh, will be you know discussed later meaning the muslims not marrying and no longer having kids and what that means for the ummah what that means for the society uh, you know that you live in um, it has great harms it has great harms and so this is uh, this is a, a huge issue a huge a, a huge issue where when we derive our outlook, not from our religion, but our view of marriage, when that is formed based on the fake world that we're constantly looking at and trying to be like and trying to live like, this is what happens, that you no longer want marriage. You, you become content with just dating anyone, spending time with this one and that one. And in, in, in one year, maybe four or five different partners, that type of life only leads to misery and depression and heartache and loneliness. And we see the examples of that. We see the examples of that from these same individuals that we're trying to imitate and live like all the time. But because we're so stuck in the moment and, and the glamour and all of that stuff, you know, deceives us, what happens is we ignore it. What happens is we ignore it and we try to, you know, remain in that, in that state and not actually uh, any focus on what is real 
not actually focus on what is real and actually uh, live our lives according to uh, the Quran and Sunnah. My advice regarding these, um, you know, previous points mentioned is to abandon all of these influences that form these types of outlooks for us, whether it's to do with the issue of marriage and when it, whether it's to do with anything that is part of our religion. And so this, you know, this is an agenda. And that's one thing we have to realize that these things are not there just for our entertainment. They're there to make us think a certain way, behave a certain way, act a certain way, right? Like certain things, dislike certain things. It is, it is to make us be other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to be. And so the biggest mistake that we make is that we think that, you know, these movies and these TV shows and all this reality TV that we're constantly, you know, um, uh, taking in is actually there, there just for pure entertainment. And that's a huge mistake. That is what makes you who you are. These are the people that you're following. These are the people that you're following their lives on social media, watching what they do, watching what they eat, how they dress, what they like, right? And then we think that it's just entertainment. It is not entertainment. It is actually making you who you are. It is forming how you think and how you behave. It is forming the things you like and you dislike. And more often than not, that is completely against what your religion is. It is completely against what your religion states that you should like and that you should dislike, or that you should love and that you should hate. Now, now that we've discussed the harms of, um, you know, the different influences that we have that give us a warped um, outlook on marriage as it pertains to our, you know, as Muslims, we'll now discuss the importance of marriage in Islam. What is marriage in Islam? What is the purpose of marriage? Why do we get married in Islam? So for, for those who, for example, have no desire for marriage anymore, see no benefit in marriage, whether it's a brother or a sister, what are the benefits of marriage in Islam? And this is for, and, 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 and I'll tell you, why we can't see it and why we cannot see as Muslims the benefit for us is because we're not living by our religion. We're not living by our deen meaning that the things that our religion will tell us are beneficial for us we're not living for those things aslan and that is why we don't see any benefit in it so someone who is living for example just to stack money and follow their desires with money they're not living for the akhirah and so why why would it benefit them to then have more children to increase the ummah as is one of the benefits we'll mention they don't see any value in that because it does not give them money. It does not this and that, this and that. And one of the harms for the brother side from the red pill movement is this idea that you should just keep sleeping with a bunch of women and never commit to anyone. That is completely against the religion of Islam. It's the complete opposite. And the thing is, they, they exaggerate the fear. And although there is, there are obviously harms that affect men. And there is a fear, kind of a fear of, you know, how do I know what this woman is going to be like? And likewise for sisters, how do I know that this man is not going to do this to me and that to me? There is that general fear because of just how corrupt the world has become in general. However, to exaggerate that when it comes to the Red Pool movement and use that to say, never commit to a woman, never give anything to a woman. Um, there is no benefit uh, when it comes to marriage for a man, especially living in the West because this can happen to you and that can happen to you. This is all in the scope and in the context of kuffar. This is because they are the ones who live this way. And it is regarding their women. Usually, if a woman is a practicing Muslimah, and if she's practicing in the actual definition of practicing, not just wearing a shijab and a niqab and claiming this and claiming that, but in reality, she does everything... Uh, either a non-practicing sister would do or a non-Muslim, you know, a non-Muslim would do. Well, that's not what I'm talking about when I say practicing. I mean someone who is truly practicing the deen of, the deen of, the deen of Islam. 
that they will not do that to you. So that fear should not exist regarding those who actually practice the deen. Practice it in the way that Allah and His Messenger have commanded. And now the only job is to find that person. The only job is to find that person. So the importance of marriage in Islam. Number one, it's the sunnah of the prophets. That it is the way of all of the prophets of the past. So by doing this and by fulfilling this act, you are following in the footsteps of the greatest of creation. The greatest individuals or human beings to ever walk the face of earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ra'd, verse 38, And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And indeed we sent messengers before you, referring to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and made for them wives and offspring. And it was not for a messenger to bring a sign except by Allah's leave. For each and every matter there is a decree from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we all know, the story of the three individuals, the three men who came to the uh, house of the wives of the Prophet وسلم, asking about the Worship of the Prophet ﷺ, meaning when he was in his home, how was he? So these three individuals, after hearing that, and this is just summarizing the hadith due to time, uh, one of them said that he will all, he will pray the entire night, and he will not sleep. The other said he will fast the entire year, and he will not break his fast. And the other one said, I will keep away from women altogether and I will not marry. And if we pay attention to this, because what it shows here is three individuals from the Sahaba who due to hearing of the worship of the Prophet wasallam, they had a good intention. They wanted to be like the Prophet in terms of worship. And so they believed then that they had to sacrifice part of that which was good, you know, that which was permissible for them. They believed they had to sacrifice. One of them believed he had to sacrifice his sleep. The other one believed he had to sacrifice uh, breaking his fast, meaning you know eating during the day, and the other one avoiding marriage altogether, so that he can, so that they could be practicing, and yani worshiping Allah to the highest level. So their intention was actually good. Compare that today then to the Muslims who actually abandon marriage. So you know, referring to the last individual. Abandon marriage for things that are not permissible. Or for ideas that they've taken from kufa. And I don't want to get married because of this. And I don't want to get married because of that. Right? So when it comes to the deen, then the Prophet وسلم, after hearing that from these men, he said, Man raghiba an sunnati falaysa minni. Referring to them, whosoever does not want my way or does not want to follow, does not wish to follow my way, his sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then he is not from me. This is bara'ah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam freeing himself from these individuals. Individuals who had a good intention, however, they do not, they did not follow the sunnah in the, cor in the correct way. Or yani, they believed they were doing something right, but they made a mistake. The third benefit of marriage in Islam is to protect one's private parts. To protect one's private parts. And there it was a in uh, Bukhari a Muslim on the authority of uh, Ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu the well-known hadith where the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was with a group of young men who had no wealth. And the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them Ya ma'ashar al-shabab من استطاع منكم الباءة فليتزوج فإنه أغض للبصر وأحصن للفرج ومن لم يستطع فعليه بالصوم فإنه له وجاء The Prophet said O oh young men whoever among you can marry should marry 
because it helps him lower his gaze and guard his modesty. And whoever is not able to marry, then he should fast, as fasting diminishes his uh, yani sexual desire. The fourth point regarding uh, marrying, yani marriage, is companionship and peace and tranquility. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Rum, verse 21, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And among his signs is this, that he created for you wives from among yourselves, that you may find repose in them. That you find peace and tranquility in them. And he has put between you affection and mercy. Verily in that are indeed signs for a people who reflect. The fifth benefit of marriage in Islam and from the purposes of marriage in Islam is offspring, having children. And in the hadith of Anas ibn Malik where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, تزوج الودود الولود فإني مكاثر مكاثر الأنبياء يوم القيامة that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says marry the loving and fertile women verily I will have most followers among the prophets on the day of resurrection and so when we compare then the idea of marriage and the benefits of marriage and how it Yani uh, helps the society be a productive society with the family intact, right? And compare that to a society of zina and children being born out of wedlock and immorality, yani being widespread in the land. Can anyone, yani, in all, in, you know, if they're honest with themselves? say that this is better than the other, yani that the latter is better than the former, that a society with zina and children being born out of wedlock and single mothers and children who do not know their father and all of that is better than a society where the family, the father and mother are there and they have children and they're raising their children to be yani, upright individuals uh, in, in society. There's no comparison between the two. There is no comparison between the two. That concludes the first segment of this podcast and the first episode in the series. Inshallah ta'ala, stay tuned for the second episode, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, which will deal with the roles and responsibilities and where we derive that from in Islam, where we derive that from in Islam.